Hi, my name is Debbie Whaley and I'm the pastor here at Mount Washington Presbyterian Church. We're so glad you're joining us for this third week in Lent in the series, Were You There? We know that so many of us across this country have been wondering about COVID vaccines, when we'll be able to get them, or for those of you who have already gotten them, wow, hooray. But that actually has a huge implication of when we'll gather again back in our sanctuary. I just want to let all of you who are part of our MWPC community know that our session is taking up these issues. They are praying about these issues. We're following the best science and the safety guidelines, and we expect to have some announcements coming up soon. You know the environment's rapidly changing. It seems like every day there's a new announcement, and we're trying to stay on top of it. But we want you to know that as soon as it's safe for our staff, for all of you, and for good modeling of good, healthy outcomes for our community, we will be back in our building as soon as we can. But even then, we'll have a lag. There'll be a lag between when we can be back in our building and everyone is safe to be back in the building. So we're gonna keep uh, continuing to offer online and eventually live streaming services so no one is left out. Anyway, pray for our session, pray for our staff, pray for our leaders as they figure out the best ways to get us back to normal. And now let me invite you to prepare your heart for worship. Yes, there are burdens all around. COVID's a big one. But this is a moment where we can bring those concerns before God to allow the Spirit to speak into our context. So I invite you, switch it up. Take a huge deep breath. Invite the Spirit to be present. And as the music plays, prepare your hearts as we uh, prepare to worship God together.
Praise the Lord, all you peoples. Praise him with your hearts. Open up your souls so that you may be open to what the Spirit is saying. Give God glory and offer him your respect by listening to what God is saying to you. Let us worship God together. Let us build a house where love can dwell and all can safely live. A place where saints and children tell how hearts learn to forgive. Build of hope and dreams and visions, rock of faith and vault of grace. Hear the love of Christ shall end dear. love is more powerful than our sin. Let us confess our sin. God of steadfast love, we tremble before you for we know our transgressions. We have failed to be the dedicated followers of Christ we intended to be. We have fallen short of Christ's expectations for us. We have doubted your presence, ignored your blessings, and resented your inclusiveness. Correct our courses and enable us to live in a spirit of love and acceptance with all people. Blot out our iniquities, we pray, and wash us clean. Help us do what is pleasing in your sight O Lord, our God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Oh, oh, oh. 
kids, welcome to the Time for Children. If you've been worshiping with us at Mount Washington, you know that we are in the season of Lent. That's right, Lent. Lent is the season we, as Christians, prepare our hearts for Easter. And Easter is so close. It will be here soon. So today I want to talk to you about a story that Pastor Debbie is going to talk about to the grown-ups. And um, it's kind of a sad story. And so I wanted to share with you a portion about it. And so let me tell you wh where we are in the story and what's happening. So we're in Jerusalem. Jesus is on his way to be crucified. And so Jesus has been um, beaten and hurt by the Romans and he is really exhausted. So that's where we are in the story. So let me tell you about a character in the story. His name is Simon. And Simon is not from Jerusalem. He's from Cyrene. So he's from a totally different place. He probably looks different. He probably doesn't speak the language. Um, I'm sure he had a plan for that day, a plan to do something. Um, but the guards grabbed him and made him carry a portion of Jesus's cross to the place called the skull or Golgotha. And so this poor man, Simon, who is a stranger, an outsider, looks different, has a plan for his day, gets snatched and told by these mean guys that he's gonna do this hard physical labor that has no reward in it. But let me remind you who was with Simon every step of the way. Jesus. And so I know that this story is interesting, but it can be kind of comforting to know that even though Simon was an outsider, he was different, he was experiencing something hard, something sad, Jesus was with him. And so when you experience something hard, or you're an outsider, or you're alone, I want you to know, just like Simon, Jesus is with you. Jesus walks with you every step of your life. So think about it. When the next time maybe you see someone sitting alone at the lunch table, maybe think and invite them over. Or the next time someone may be sad, Use your smile to change how they're feeling. And remember that Jesus is there with you, just like Jesus is there with all of the people around your life. I want Jesus to walk with
This morning, our scripture comes to us from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verses 26 through 31. We are dropped into the narrative of Jesus' death as he is being led to Golgotha. Let's listen to the word of God. As they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene. He was coming from the country, and they laid the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A great number of people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? The word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue in our series this week on Were You There? We're examining key figures in the life of Jesus in this Passion Week, the time between Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. And we've been asking ourselves, sort of inspired by that great African-American spiritual, were you there when these various things happened? Or these, who are you in the story? Who can you relate to? Well, today we come to a set of uh, characters that are really quite unusual. And oftentimes we don't even pay much attention to them, especially one group, a group of women called the Daughters of Jerusalem. You see, let me just back up and put you in the story. So we are, have now completed Jesus' trial. He's been harassed and harangued by the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leadership. He's actually seen Pilate. He's been now beaten almost to the point of death. He's been stripped bare and is now experiencing the public humiliation of marching through the streets of Jerusalem. That was traditional in those days that a criminal would carry their cross beam across the back of their neck. The vertical poles that we often see when we think about the crucifixion were already in place. They were placed outside the city and on a predominant roadway so that anyone who walked by those who had been crucified would be able to see Rome's power. It was a way of humiliating the criminals, but also serving as a like a billboard of sorts to the community. Don't get out of line or this may happen to you. There were times when uh, Rome crucified criminals and there might have been 20 or 30 or 50 of them. But in this case, we know there were at least three. The Gospels tell us that. But as part of the ramp up and the way that Rome sort of meant to make these criminals uh, an example, they would parade them through the streets, the crowded streets, as they made their way outside the city walls. And so they would stir up the crowds. They would make sure this was like a parade so that the people within the city, as well as those entering the city from the outside walls, were aware of what was going on. And that's the scene where we are today and that we're looking at. These, this little teeny snippet of a story about Simon of Cyrene and the daughters of Jerusalem. They are caught up in this huge crowd of spectators who are following the criminals as they are making their way through the city streets out outside the city walls to be then placed on the crosses and left there to die a terrible death. It's an interesting story because we know that Luke, the author, is very intentional about the details that he includes. At the beginning of the gospel, he's talking about to his patron, um, Theophilus, that Theophilus, I'm making a really concerted study here. I interviewed eyewitnesses so that you might be enlightened about the gospel of what you believe. And so we know that Luke doesn't include details that aren't important. He's very thoughtful about the way he arranges things, and he's very thoughtful about what he includes. We also know that uh, St. Luke was an amazing scholar and a person who emphasized and lifted up the stories of women. And so while this little snippet about the daughters of Jerusalem is mostly puzzling to us, the Catholics at least have this as one of the stations of the cross, but Protestants don't give a lot of attention to the daughters of Jerusalem and who they were, and we don't really give a lot of attention to Simon. 
But today we're going to focus in on these sets of people and what they may represent and how it brings us into the scene. First, let's talk about Simon, Simon of Cyrene. The Cyrene uh, community was in what's now modern day Libya. And in that community was a large Jewish contingent that was there. And so it's not surprising that Simon, who's identified as Simon the Serene, probably was in Jerusalem for the Passover festival, an expectation that faithful Jewish people would return to the city several times a year for their sacred pilgrimages. And while those who often lived way outside of the realm of Jerusalem or Israel in that day, they would make these pilgrimages periodically to show their devotion. We don't really have any background about Simon. We, we really know nothing about him except that the words that the three synoptic gospels give us, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is that he was seized by the Roman soldiers and forced to carry Jesus's crossbeam. Now you may be wondering, why would the Roman soldiers do that? Well, it's speculative, but it seems reasonable, don't you think, that Jesus was completely exhausted. He had been up all night, he had been questioned by multiple people, the scriptures tell us, by the Sanhedrin, by, the, by Pilate, by Herod. He had been beaten and imprisoned and really uh, must have been exhausted, bruised, cut. Then you'll remember that the Roman soldiers, before they uh, set him on his walk through the city, through this parade through the city, they then humiliated him. They put a robe around him, they auctioned off his clothing, and they put a crown of thorns. Jesus must have been physically, emotionally, and even spiritually spent. And very likely, he had stumbled and fallen and wasn't able to carry this cross. And so out of the crowd, they pick Simon to carry him. Now, imagine this. Remember, this is the Roman uh, way of humiliating their people. They, we have no idea why Simon was chosen in particular. Maybe he was walking along shouting out protests against uh, Roman government. We have no idea. But the idea is that uh, Simon is violently uh, conscripted to carry this cross. Now he joins Jesus in this parade. And for Simon, this must have seemed as if now he was completely humiliated. He was carrying the crossbeam. What would prevent the crowd in that situation from imagining that Simon was the one who was about to be crucified? Imagine the others from Cyrene who might have been in the old city. Is that Simon? Is that our brother from the synagogue? What's he doing? What has he done? The speculation and the humiliation must have been intense for Simon. Then is there any possibility that Simon was a follower of Jesus? You know, the story is silent on that. But we do have one clue. When Mark tells the story of Simon of Cyrene being inscripted to carry the cross beam of Jesus, he adds a detail that neither, Mark, that neither Matthew nor Luke include. And he says, Simon of Cyrene, father of Rufus and Alexander. It's as if Mark is, is indicating to his community, hey, you know, it's that Simon. You know, you know Rufus and Alexander? which has led scholars to project and conjecture that uh, Rufus and Alexander were part of the Christian community in Cyrene. This also gets reinforced by the fact that the tradition holds that St. Mark, the author of the book of Mark, was the bishop of Cyrene. So this might have been uh, Mark's way of saying, hey guys in my community that I'm writing this gospel to, take note. This is Simon. Yeah, that's Simon, the one whose father is uh, of Rufus and Alexander, people who are part of our community. We can only imagine that Simon in this moment is forced to do something he didn't want to do. Something was imposed upon him, something that would have caused great humiliation and a necessary explanation further down the road. But it may have also been a place of transformation as he was forced to walk beside Jesus, can you imagine the conversation that would have happened? Or perhaps being right involved. I mean, they would have had to take that crossbeam off of Simon and then attach Jesus to it. And as they hoisted Jesus up, Simon himself, exhausted and humiliated, was very likely at the foot of the cross as Jesus was put on the cross. You have to wonder, 
What did Simon think that day? What did Simon engage about with Jesus or think about Jesus? Was Simon part of the community that awaited um, Jesus and his instructions and the, the following of the Spirit after uh, Jesus was ascended? Because it does say that these Cyrenians, these uh, disciples from Cyrene, eventually became so in, on fire and engaged for the gospel of Jesus that they were the very first people to preach to groups of Gentiles up in Antioch. The first spread of that Holy Spirit fire was activated by some disciples from Cyrene. Could Simon have been part of that group? We don't know, but it's kind of fun to think about. When I think about this particular uh, scripture, of course, maybe go back and think about where else have we heard this call about carrying the cross of Christ? And we see it in the words of Jesus in chapter 9 of Luke. It's amazing. Luke, as he's presenting the story, is very careful to discuss Jesus' suffering only after the disciples have made the declaration that Jesus is the Messiah. This is after the feeding of the 5,000. This is after the disciples have gone out and shown the power of Jesus' name by healing people out in the countryside. And then when he comes back, and they come back, and they join together, and they have this conversation about the core identity of who Jesus is, it's only then, in the book of Luke, that Jesus begins to talk about his suffering. And when he does, in that very first conversation with those disciples, he says, if anyone wants to be my disciple, let them take up my cross, take up their cross, and follow me. It makes me wonder this, this intentionality of Luke's, whether he's including Simon as a way of, of signaling to the disciples that yes, you will have to pick up a cross of suffering of humiliation at some point to follow me. But then perhaps known within Luke's community, but certainly known within uh, Mark's community, we can see that whatever Simon's connection was to this event, he's a significant person to be named by name and possibly that his sons are key leaders in the Christian movement. How did picking up the cross of Christ transform Simon? How does picking up the cross of Christ in our lives transform us? Well, then I want to go on to this other really strange sort of a group of people, the Daughters of Jerusalem, because we really don't pay much attention to it. And it's confusing and it feels really painful. I mean, it says the women were uh, right after they've conscripted Simon, that the women are following him and crying out and grieving and, and pouring out their hearts uh, on behalf of Jesus. And it says that Jesus, even in his physical, spiritual, and emotional exhaustion turns and addresses them. And if we were to sum up what he says, he basically says, hey folks, don't worry about me. It's gonna get a lot worse for you. In fact, it's gonna be so bad for you women, you uh, are gonna wish you never had children. In fact, you're gonna wish that all of the world would have collapsed. And then he goes on, he says this strange statement, and he says, if they can do this while the reed is green, imagine what they're gonna do when the reed is dry. And basically what he's saying in this prophetic word to these women is, it's only going to get worse. And it's going to get worse for you so much that you may even curse the fact of your existence. And if you think this is an unjust, injustice, injustice has not even begun to be unleashed. And we know that Luke writing after the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD is actually holding up for those daughters of Jerusalem what actually did happen. The destruction and the burning of Jerusalem uh, totally scattered the Jewish community. It was a, a breach of the soul that they felt when their city was turned to rubble. And they scattered throughout the whole Roman Empire, seen as pariahs ever uh, since, only to intensify in other military campaigns of Rome. You see, Rome intended to wipe out the Jews for their insubordination. When crucifixion wasn't enough, then they just raised the city. They wanted to bring these early, um, the Jews of the first century, as well as Christians, under their thumb and under their control. So when 
Jesus turns and says this, and, and Luke captures it for us. Is it another echo of what has just happened with Simon? Is it a, a figurative way of saying to the daughters of Jerusalem, look, if you want to be my disciple, take up my cross and follow me. And when you do, it's only going to get worse. When I think about these stories on the time of passion, I, I think about some of the things we go through in our lives. Suffering and the causes of suffering and why do we suffer are one of the biggest theological questions that the church ever has to deal with, that we as human beings ever have to contend with. In fact, in the OT20 class, those of us who are reading through the Old Testament, we're in the book of Job. And of course, Job is all about that particular question. I was thinking about this because, you know, this whole COVID crisis has been something that all of us have suffered through. There's, there's not a person on the planet that doesn't know what COVID is. There's no one that hasn't had their lives disrupted. Not, not a, a single one whose lives have not been impacted by COVID and this pandemic. And in this season, it seems like it's been a cross that we have been called to bear. Not unlike Simon, something happened to us. We had something interrupt our lives, disrupt our lives, cause us to suffer that none of us asked for. None of us were responsible for bringing this onto our, uh, bringing it to a head. And yet, we find ourselves, like Simon, carrying the crossbeam of COVID. That crossbeam means that we don't get to gather in the ways that we want to, whether with families, whether it's in church or in community. It means that there's been incredibly suffering across our country. Not only have we had well over a half a million deaths related to COVID, but we've also had long-term disabilities that have uh, emerged out of people who've survived COVID, but who are not 100% well. It means that businesses and uh, have been disrupted across not only this country, but across the globe. Worshiping communities have had unevenness in their ability to gather and how they gather. And we know without a doubt that COVID has been an emotional lightning rod, hasn't it? Whether how you've waited the scientific information or how you've uh, waited the news that's come out of Washington, all of that stuff has impacted the ways we've talked to each other. And there's been a social rip in the fabric of our country as we've uh, not really known how to navigate this in a sense of unity or common purpose. Together, we have had to bear the cross beam of COVID. And there are moments when I must admit that it feels like Jesus addressing us like he addressed those women in Jerusalem. Don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves. It's going to get hard. You're going to wish that this had never come. You're going to be angry. You're going to be disappointed. You're going to wish and, and want reality to be far different than it is. And yet, even in the midst of of bearing that cross, we know that we obediently follow Christ. It's an amazing story to consider that whether Simon himself becomes a disciple of Jesus, we know that uh, the role of those from Cyrene takes an incredibly important role in the spread of the gospel. They, uh, the people from Cyrene, whether Rufus and Alexander or others, are part of the community that spreads the gospel and says that grace is bigger than any suffering. We know that Luke would not have included this story about the daughters of Jerusalem because of his interest in women if perhaps some of those, quote, daughters of Jerusalem had not become disciples themselves. The story is preserved because someone found that meaningful. And it's very likely it was um, some among the women that Jesus addressed. In that taking up the cross that we are forced to bear, the resilience that we gain, the dependence that we have then on God to carry us through is powerful in our lives. And while I don't believe that God brings that suffering with intention, it's an invitation like the book of Job is to demonstrate what faithfulness is. Not to answer the big question of why do bad things happen to good people. That, that's almost impossible. But uh, we can say, like what happens in the book of Job, 
that faithful people, even when bad things happen, continually pour out their, uh, their despair to God and they listen for God's word of hope. And that word of hope may be different in every situation. So friends, were you there? No, I wasn't in the crowd that day, nor were you. But I know what it feels like, and I know you do too, to carry that crossbeam that requires us to make hard decisions, to sometimes have to bear the consequences that are forced upon us. But we also know in the season and can be invited to trust God all the more and look to the future with hope. Amen.
Let us pray. We are thankful, O God, for your presence on our Lenten journey toward the cross. Help us sense its importance for our lives and to make this an intentional time of prayer and renewal for us individually and for our homes, church, and community. Increase our yearning to seek your face and follow Jesus more closely. Strengthen us to set aside our cynicism, apathy, and unbelief, and to surrender ourselves to your spirit with earnestness and enthusiasm. Grant us a deeper sense of your presence and unconditional love. Let a fresh wind of your spirit blow through our lives, awakening hope and energy. Show us how to love one another again, not only those close to us, but also neighbors and strangers. Revive our church to its calling in Christ and our mission in the world. We seek to be redeemed in fuller measure, O Lord, our God. Pour out your healing mercies to those ill in body, mind, spirit, or circumstance. Continue to heal the divides of racism, sexism, ageism, classism, and homophobia within our nation, within the world. Renew our faith that love is the most powerful force for change in the world. We ask this in Jesus' name, the one whose demonstration of love on the cross has indeed changed the world. Hear us as we pray the prayer our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Your only son, no sin to hide, but you have set him from your side to walk upon this guilty sod and to become the Lamb of God. Oh, Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. Oh, wash me. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, your gift of love was crucified. We laughed and scorned him as he died. The humble king we named a fraud and sacrificed the Lamb of God. Oh, Lamb of God. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. I was so lost, I should have died. But you have brought me to your side to be led by your staff and rod and to be called the Lamb of God. Oh, Lamb of God, sweet Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. 
now go out from this place as people of hope. Yes, we all are bearing an incredible burden, some more than others, but we go out trusting that God can transform our lives, provide us with the resilience we need to keep going and the ability from our hearts to fully trust, on, trust in him. So go, trust and hope in Jesus' name. Amen. Washington Presbyterian Church. We're so delighted that you've joined us for this Lenten series on Were You There? We hope you'll check us out online at mwpc-church.org. Reach out. We'd love to welcome you into our family.